Montgomery and just, just in, answer questions. So it's not formal. Um, I've got a list of uh, you know, a bunch of stuff that's going on in Montgomery. We're kind of getting the highlights of that. But at any time, uh, you know, ask questions or uh, if you got another question that I don't cover, let us know. Uh, we got a sign up sheet going around. And then also I'm going to pass around my, uh, my cards and uh, keep those. And those, those have my numbers on it. Now I'll introduce Anna Catherine, the lady with the camera taking pictures of everybody. Um, she is actually y'all's legislative representative. And we have a, she has an office in Birmingham in the same office building I do. And we're one of the few senators that have somebody like AC. And she handles any kind of questions. Uh, our website, um, grants that, uh, that we might can apply for. So she handles all that stuff. She goes to Montgomery too. She probably knows more about Montgomery than I do. Um, but with, having said that, uh, Mayor, would you like to say a couple words to everybody? Well, yeah, I'd like to first of all congratulate one of the members of our new members of our planning and zoning commission who last night uh, led a commission ahead of the new leadership from the new composition. One night accomplished what that board did not accomplish in four years. So congratulations, Kelly. Uh, we now have uh, headed to the council the planning uh, uh, document for the uh, planning community development, which will allow Grand River to go forward. So that was a major step forward. Ten o'clock this morning, we're going to meet with uh, uh, Representative Drake, myself, and some uh, other people are going to be meeting to get some money from the state. Acre of money to go ahead and finish the, uh, the four laning of Drex Lake Road, which will go down to where the first phase of <coughs> Grand River will be. And by the way, there's not a single apartment in that development. And, uh, also, we'll be asking for money to provide a bridge over here over Little Cahaba and put in a turn lane to try to reduce the uh, congestion at our uh, elementary school. Uh, we're doing a lot. Uh, we're undoing a lot. I think we're moving forward. I think Lee is on the verge of this uh, beautiful uh, explosion of this managed growth, good growth, high quality growth. And uh, so, and by the way, uh, my office is in the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce building. I don't have an office in the city hall. So if you'd like to come by and see the site plan for uh, where the, the library is, the city hall, and a future uh, event center is going to go on that property across the windscreen. You're welcome to come by any time. My door is open. The only question I have for the mayor is we're driving in. It looked like the uh, fire station was making progress. Yeah, it's making too much. <laughs> <laughs> is that a good thing or bad? Actually, it's a wonderful fire station. We needed the fire station. Uh, we're not real happy with where it's located, but uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a state-of-the-art fire station. And our city hall will be breaking ground before long on the uh, property downtown where it should be. Okay. Dickie, would you like to say some words to everybody? Say hello? I think I've already covered everything. We've had an interesting week in, uh, in Montgomery. I, I want to talk about one thing. You want to talk about anything? Absolutely. That's what we're here for. I want to shoot down some rumors about House Bill 84, it's the flexibility bill for the schools. Have y'all heard about that bill? Flexibility bill, school flexibility? Let me, let me tell you something. This is actually a fantastic bill for the schools. And what it does, it gives the school systems, local school systems, an opportunity to apply to the state to become a in school. And what, the, what it really means is if you, if you live in a rural area where there's a lot of farming going on, you have the opportunity to bring a farmer in to help supplement, uh, supplement the, the teacher in the classroom and, and, <coughs> and teach how his education applies to what he's doing. I and mean, that's, that's a simple example. But that's, that's one way you can do it. They can change their curriculum, and, um, and I think that's a fantastic thing. But the problems we've had with this bill, and uh, I'd like to st say first that every educational association in the state of Alabama is for this bill, with the exception of ADA. They've shot us down on every every corner. But the thing they were concerned with was tenure, pay scale, and uh, what else was it? Uh, charter schools. Charter schools. And none of those things were mentioned in the they, they covered me up with phone calls. Phone. They have really dirty tactics, to be honest with you. I got like 75 phone calls in an hour and a half, and I couldn't get anything done for us with phone. And finally, I got to ask these people, what are your concerns with this bill? Charter school. I said, man, here's my personal cell phone number, because they called me a 1-800 number. 
here's my personal cell phone number. I want you to go back and read this bill to tell me where you see charter schools in this bill. Nobody called me that. And it's just, it's just falsehoods that are put out. In essence, this is a great bill. We passed it in the House yesterday, so it's great to see you yeah. got your version. We, we, passed, we passed it out of committee uh, in the Senate yesterday. Okay. So it's on, on the way to the Senate floor. In case you don't know how that works. We've got to make it out, too. It, we, there was an amendment added. Well, what we did, just to, just to satisfy them, we went back into, into the field. It didn't say anything about charter schools, but we put language in there that says there will be no charter schools. You know, they, this will not cut your pay. This, this will not affect your tenure. This will, you know, try to pacify them, and they're still upset. Like, you can't satisfy them. But uh, it is it is a great bill. So if you hear anything about that, uh, if you anybody got any questions, be sure to call me or Slade. I think it's a great bill for the schools and uh, educate our children. Um, I, I don't know how many people here know it. Do y'all know they don't even teach person writing in school anymore? Anybody know that? I didn't. I did. I, I, I've got a niece over in Georgia. She's 13 years old. She can't read or write in this. 13 years old. <laughs> and, and I found that astonishing. I mean, how do you sign a legal document? Because your signature is your identifies you. But anyway, that's it. That's, all I want to say about that, Ben. I'll keep standing. We, we don't want to get into some other stuff. Uh, all right, so before we get into some other th stuff on the Senate, um, we did this last session. Every 10 years, we um, change our district lines, the House and the Senate. And so I wanted to let you guys know what lines have changed for me and maybe the same as well. I know you can't really tell on this map. It's kind of confusing. But this is Irondale, and this is Leeds right here. I'm actually going to lose Irondale as part of my district, and I'm going to lose half of Trustville, which is the interstate. But I'm keeping uh, Trustville, Leeds, all of the Mountain Brook area, um, and this is let's see, this is Highway 280 it comes down. And as you can see, I've got almost everything down 280, and then everything in the blue in Talladega is going to be part of my new district. So good thing is I'm staying with you guys. That's probably a good or bad thing. Uh, for some of you, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but Dickie, what are you, what are your mind changing? My, my district's changing quite a bit. Right now, it's uh, right. Leeds, part of Moose, Irondale, Center Point, Huffman, and Mountain Brook. I'm losing Center Point, Huffman, yay. Uh, I'm losing that because it's all Democrats anyway. But uh, I'm gaining a little more of Irondale, I'm losing a little bit of Mountain Brook. I'm also losing all of South Clair County, all the crossings in the city of Leeds, and Leeds, it's in St. Clair County. I did very well in that district, in that, those boxes. I, I really wanted to keep them. Uh, I lost them in the new district. And uh, I'm picking up Shelby County. Everything south of 119 is east of 280, all the way to the west. Oh, no, Yeah, so I'm going to have to get a horse and buggy and go campaign because those houses are so far apart. That's my district. Yeah, it's so, good. Uh, I got Cherokee, but not Cherokee. I got uh, Greystone, High Lakes, and Mount Morrow, which is a pretty populated area. The rest of them are very, very small. We, I can help you out with all my current district and the district. Uh, talking about uh, a list of things to talk about, and, and Dickie and I can weigh in on all this, we thought we'd give you kind of like inside baseball about some things that are happening, some things you'll read about, some things you won't read about. So we got a list of them, um, not in any particular order, but one of the big issues right now in Montgomery is gun legislation. Um, and there's kind of three parts to the gun legislation everybody's talking about. I might get your opinion on one, put you on the hot seat. Um, the, the question of may versus shall. Currently, the law is if you want to go get a pistol permit, you have to apply for a pistol permit, but the sheriff has the discretion that he may give you a license. Let's say you, you, uh, you pass the background check and you, you turn in your $20 pistol permit, the sheriff can decide, he has the discretion, uh, that he may issue a license. One of the things that uh, NRA and some other folks want to do is change the word may to shall and mandate that if you pass the background check, that the uh, sheriff shall give you a pistol permit. Now, I'm going to give you kind of two sides, and you weigh in what you think, too. You know, one side is it's the Second Amendment right to... to carry uh, bare arms that I should have the right to carry a, a pistol or rifle anytime I want to. Uh, I don't think anybody will disagree with that. You know, the current law says that you can carry a shotgun uh, in your car at any time. Uh, and actually the law in Alabama says 
uh, you can carry a, a, a pistol open on your hip at any time, anywhere you want to go. We're an open carry state. Um, so that's one side. Now the other side is the sheriffs that approve uh, the pistol permit say, well, he may have a clear background, but I know if he's a crack dealer or if he's mentally unstable or he's got, you know, his mother tells me that he's going to shoot somebody. So you got the sheriffs over here saying, we like the discretion to say yes or no, but then over on this side you've got, um, and I don't want to say NRA, but the Second Amendment, very pro NRA folks going, well, it's my right to carry guns. So that's kind of a an interesting issue. I, Vicky, I don't know if you want to mention anything. I think you covered it. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, I see both sides of it. I mean, like you say, the big thing is it's not gun control per se that's killing all these people. Uh, just the permits wouldn't make any difference. But I see the sheriff's, I see the sheriff's side of it. I mean, like you say, you, you may be able to pass a background check about one sandwich short of a big one. And, uh, <laughs> You don't, you don't want people like that carrying anything around. So I don't see the sheriff's department. So that's going to be a touch, touchy issue. And the second part of the, about guns, the gun legislation is, do we put guns in school? Uh, there's been a lot of push off with all the shootings and going on around the country. Do we allow certain individuals in schools to carry guns? You know, one of the legislations uh, that's been passed around is saying, hey, we will train some teachers that will have military training, police training, um, and they will be able to carry guns in the school to protect the children. And, I, and I, there again, we've had some several conversations with the folks in Shelby County, the sheriff and the administrators and the uh, school board. Is that something we want to do? Now I'll tell you, again, another pros and uh, cons to it. Some of the educators are saying, you know, why don't we keep the resource officers that are currently in a lot of the schools, not all the schools, uh, they carry guns. Why don't we just increase resource officers for every school and let them carry guns? Because they know the students, they're there every day, and they're trained. The bad part about that is, I can't remember the number, it's like 25 or $30 million a year to put resource officers in, all, in every school. Now the other side is, if the school board or the, the, the school Appoint one or two of these people to carry guns in school. Is that the direction we want to go? Any thoughts, comments? I don't like the liability. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say my name is Holbert Thomas. I graduated from Leeds High School in 1979. I'm a retired first class gun in the United States Navy. So I'm a very strong supporter of the first and the second amendment. Uh, I also understand, though, with that right comes responsibility. We can't have every lunatic out there with the right to have a gun. And I understand the background checks. They should be thorough. They should be in depth. And I agree that the sheriff's departments should have the discretion to, to say this person should not own a gun. I, I agree with that because, like I said, with that right comes responsibility. As far as uh, guns in schools, I don't believe the teachers should have guns. I think law enforcement trained professionals should be armed, <coughs> standing at the doorway, at the entrance of these schools, to protect our children. And my personal opinion, if we can spend billions of dollars to allocate money for abortions, we can spend millions of money to protect the children we have in our schools. Sheriff Curry down in Shelby County hit the county, hit the county commission up to $20,000 a week. But, but put, sheriff, put sheriff in the two schools. Yes, sir. And the, I feel like the, uh, the discussion is worthwhile. But I'm a little concerned that we haven't gotten deeper into what security measures are available. For one time installation in the schools is literally. Any kind of uh, uh, penetration about a history that is not authorized is, is one of the, you know, uh, raise the alarm and what have you. And I mean, there's just system that uh, you can't violate. Jim, can I say one thing about that? When this thing happened, Sandy Hook, I, I got I got granddaughter in the school up here. I can say, well, what if that happened in the you walk into the 
Lake Hill Vineyard School. You've got two doors there that you can't get through. You go into a door through the office, check in, and you go out another door. What's to keep that guy from walking in and shooting that person going out the other door? You've got free access to the school. Then I thought, well, you don't really have to do that. Around the school, the of the school, you've got glass windows. People just go outside and start shooting the glass. Uh, yeah. we, we put some thought into it, and trust me, the children's safety is of utmost importance to everybody in Montgomery. We're going to come up with some kind of solution. Yeah. And one of the things that I know they're doing in Shelby County is they're trying to figure out a, a way that every time you enter the school, you have to check in at, I mean, before you go anywhere, you have to check in at the office. Yeah. And the doors are locked. And there's safety plans. But, you know, it comes back to how do you protect all the children all the time from everything? Meaning, like, on a school bus, uh, as we know what happened in the last couple of weeks in, in Alabama, how do you protect them on the playground? How do you protect them in the school? So that's that's a difficult question to answer. Um, all right, well, switching gears, uh, the last question. Uh, all I want to do, I, I want to echo what Mr. Saxon said. I would like... It, I, I, I don't want any more feel-good laws, right. okay? And I don't want the legislature concentrating on something where we go, we're Alabama, don't take our guns. Right. Now, I'm a veteran, and I'm one of those that says that too. However, I'm just like Hobart and everybody else. But I think Mr. Saxon hit it right on the head. This needs to be about school protection, school kids. I brought up the analogy, and a guy laughed at me about castles and moats. You know, the whole idea behind a moat was you got to get past the moat to get to the castle. So my whole thing is let's make our children safe. And you went even further than that. It's got to carry over to the schools, everything else. But, I mean, I'm all for my property taxes going up or anything that I have to do as a citizen to really focus on making things safe. So that's all I want to say. I think you're right on target. Um, all right, we spent a lot of time on this issue. We got some more, but the last issue about the guns is three parts. Is um, there's a question about being able to take guns to work, and so what that involves is being able to take a pistol um, in your car to the place of your work. And so, um, and there's some pros and cons to both sides of that story. You know, some of the things is some of the women drive into Birmingham and they need might need protection driving back home after hours. Um, the flip side of that is. Um, you know, if you work at a nuclear power plant, do we allow people to take guns to a nuclear power plant? And that's extreme, don't get me wrong. Um, so that, that's the three parts. Um, so you'll see some bills going through the legislature trying to address all three of those. All right, switching gears a little bit. Um, I thought this was a bit interesting one. You probably hadn't heard about it at all um, in, the, uh, in the news. And I call it the concrete versus asphalt. Uh, which is actually called, there's a bill called the Life Cycle Bill uh, that's kind of coming the way through. And what this bill says is most of our roads right now, as y'all know, are, are asphalt. Some of them are, are concrete. Well, there's a bill being pushed by the Concrete Association that's, that's called a Life Cycle Bill that says when the Department of Transportation does a, does a project over $3 million, that they will have to do two sets of plans. Just like you do your, archi your uh, architect goes for a house. And you'll have a set of plans that will be for a concrete road, a set of plans that will be for an asphalt road. You'll bid them completely, and then after you bid them, you'll put them into this metrics, and they'll talk, take the life cycle of concrete, which lasts longer, you know, but it's more expensive. And then you'll come down to the end, and you'll have an analysis, and they'll tell you, should you use concrete, or you sh should you use asphalt for uh, the roads in the state of Alabama? I just thought that's an interesting bill. Uh, Bob Riley is the lobbyist for the uh, Concrete Association, so he's pushing that bill. Uh, any thoughts on that? I just thought it was kind of funny. No, I like asphalt roads, to be honest with you. So. They drive a lot better. They, they drive they a lot better, but it's also creating jobs because you're going to be doing it a lot more often. That is true. <laughs> that is true. And there's, you know, another flip side of that is there's no uh, contractors in the in the United States that actually put in concrete roads, so. Yes, sir. I'd like to make uh, one comment <clears throat> while we're all together. Uh, if you came in on uh, 1840, on the 78, uh, you passed a couple of uh, places where we have dangerous intersections, uh, like said at present, we don't have a left hand turn lane to go up to the school. So I may have mentioned the bridge here just 
matter up here in two or three hundred feet. We have a two lane bridge and four lane on this side and multi lane on the other. So when when the others and what have you just told us and we're going that back up here. <coughs> Everyone in the room, uh, probably a pre local pre <laughs> uh, The reason I mentioned it is it seems like we do not have very much pull with the state road park. We, we can, we can, can we answer that question? I'll tell you this, and Dick, Dickie's been working on getting a turn lane off the interstate. Um, the problem we have with DOT is DOT can literally do anything they want at the direction of the governor. As you know, we've got some D, uh, 280 issues. Um, Dick and I can raise hell. I mean, we can call the governor, we can go see the director. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it's really up to them. It is. I'd like to say something on that, too. Uh, Dickie, myself, uh, Mayor Lee from Moody, Bill Richardson, uh, chairman of our commercial development authority, and Joe Kelly, a businessman in Moody. We went down and we basically sat on uh, Tom Dock's desk. Uh, when uh, Mr. Cooper, who's director, state director, was in Birmingham, and we pressed everything you said. I'll be back. I'll be back. And the short answer was, uh, we hear you. Uh, now go meet with the Metropolitan Planning Organization if you want some money. So uh, the problem is just getting money out of ALDOT uh, for things that they don't have money for, unless it's uh, a, a project that the, that the state really wants to put. Now, we've got these guys here going to help us. Uh, but and we are pushing for just the things that you talked about. In fact, we've got a meeting, like I said, at 10 o'clock uh, with the uh, people to talk about acre of money for some parts of this and uh, that other thing we went to. Yeah, we went through this big building program for the school. Uh, we needed answers and we needed support. Contractors on the middle school gave me trying to get an okay uh, training system on that street to parallel to the street. So, uh, things like me, we're not where we should be in the pecking order. And that's one reason I mentioned it, because, like the mayor said, things are happening. Our traffic is going up in one day, and we need to have all the effort to get those. It was tough for lack of trying, I'll tell you that. I was like November 29th or December 22nd, I was sitting with Al Dock because one simple reason. During Christmas, I saw traffic going to Grand Shops of Grand River, mm -hmm. backed up the off ramp, half a mile down out there yes. at night. And that is an accident looking for a place to happen to traffic and stop that first time. And that really concerned me. The only thing I was asking for was deceleration lane off to the right where that traffic could get off the interstate and let the traffic flow. And yes, they, I got no word. I, mean, we're, I jumped up and down like a shortstop. But, uh, uh, I haven't given up. I've got two projects. That's one of them. And when you get to the bottom of that ground, you don't know which way to go. You know, you're not from this area. You're from the left, left shop, or right to that front shop. shop. And, and they've been working on that. We're, we're renaming the, the, the section of highways to that exit. The River Bridge and shops uh, Grand River Parkway. Grand River Parkway. Grand River Parkway. Grand River Parkway. That's that's the back doorway to get a sign up because they can't advertise for shops, but they can put a sign up identifying the road. So that's one way we're getting around that. Uh, the other thing is this this bridge right up here. I met with DOT at the grammar school last summer, and they have they laid out the plans. I was not even aware of. They laid out the plans and said in 18 months this work is going to start. Were you aware of this? this plan? They're talking about putting another bridge right here, widening that bridge, and six lanes of this road right here, all the way down to the Patterson. So, I, since we're talking about a new grammar school, the grammar school's going to leave, maybe those plans are going to I don't know. I haven't heard any more on it. Well, I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Yes, uh, I work for uh, International Student Management Group, and on the weekends I work as a school supervisor, and I drive my patrol car 12 hours anywhere between Trustful to Bethel. Surrounding areas because we got like 35 sites that I go to. I don't hit them all every night, but I go to different sites each night to check on the guards and whatnot. And 459 is a mess. I'm, talk I'm talking about the condition of the road. I, I don't know if it's the trucks or what. Just beat and, and 
I-59 northbound going toward Trussell. The right-hand lane, you cannot drive in that right-hand lane. You can't get the left side. There's no way. Hard, and, uh, is that concrete or asphalt? I, mean, I, don't, know. Just <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is. I think it's cobblestone. But, uh, uh, I live in Oliver Crossing here in Leeds. And anyone that's familiar with Oliver Crossing knows there's one way in and one way out. All right? I asked the former administration about putting a stoplight up to control traffic so that people can get out of Oliver Crossing. They're doing a study next week. Well, okay. I was the, the answer I got from the former administration was we can't put a stoplight up there because it's not quote unquote a four way. I'm like, what difference does that make? And he, that was the answer I got because it's not a four way. We can't put a stoplight up there. Yes, ma'am. Can you put a sign down in the state written indicating where Grand River is? Will it also include an arrow and comment that you should start this and 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 this did it just say leads downtown? Yeah. Parkway Drive. We see Parkway Drive or business district or something. Direct them away from downtown. I mean, I tell you how frustrating it is. The DOT won't even let us put a sign that says Barbara Motors built a speedway out on the interstate. So they were giving us a brief about that. So it's been difficult. Did Albot gives so many people so much trouble? Shouldn't there be a push by everybody to do something about that group? I would say yes. Um, it's a double-edged sword because everybody's nervous that if the bill uh, does not pass that um, your district may be um, looked over, per se. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Uh, so, but no, no, there's no doubt. And we feel, we feel the frustrating of you guys because as politicians, we want to make sure that our kids have better roads. The fact of the matter is, we don't have hardly any pool. I mean, yeah. I've done every time. Every time we hear, have you been to the MPO? What the MPO? What did that have to do with Lee County? What it has to do, and I can tell you, uh, I'm just to this out uh, through the same process you're talking about. Uh, the MPO is called the Midwest Planning Organization, and. Uh, the significance of that organization to us is that we've got money to do things with in areas where Al Dot won't help us. And the reason we haven't gotten any out of it is because we haven't been going to NPO meetings for four years and uh, uh, we've now reclaimed our seat on that, that organization and uh, hope to get in get in line to get some benefit out of it. Well now Al Dot doesn't just not do things because they don't have money, they don't allow you to do something if you're going to pay for it. The biggest problem we have yeah. in, over in um, the um, Mount Brook Homewood area is putting in sidewalks and all the regulations that the sidewalks, I mean, it's a nightmare. Uh, there was a, a storm sewer drain in the parking lot of one of my buildings that vehicles were literally falling in for three years. And you know what they finally did? Put a steel plate over the top of it. <laughs> God. Slide, if I can shift gears for one second. Yeah, we've only got about 10 more minutes. We don't want to keep everybody from working. We might oh, I mean, the local stuff, that, that's what this is for. It's important. But I want to ask you about Senate Bill 122. Right. That was John Archibald's recent. Which, which bill is that? It's the one that has to deal with streamlining. Okay. However, his focus and his piece was about the state examiner's office. Okay. And I don't know if you read the piece. I've got it here. At the, I'm not trying to get you to read it. But I didn't. But, the, but, I mean, what he's getting at, and, it, you know, Dickie's brother, Owen, was instrumental in giving our ethics commission some teeth. So, you know, actually giving them subpoena power and things like that. And that's something he and I talked about long hours into the night. And it was actually successful, as you know. But what they're worried about with this Senate Bill 122 is that you're going to remove the state examiner and the public auditing to where it no longer is an independent position but becomes a tool 
of the legislature. Is that something you can yep. comment on? I'd be or? happy to. Um, one of the initiatives, that's a good segue, uh, that we're working on, especially in the Senate, is streamlining government, which is basically downsizing government and making sure that there's, there's efficiency. Um, and there's a couple of bills that we're working on right now, and I'll we'll hit on that one, we'll hit on another one first. And one of the first bills that we just passed out of the Senate and sent to the House, and I guess y'all might be taking it up next week, is one to consolidate public safety. And right now there's about 20 agencies, or 26 agencies, that handle, uh, is that it? Is it? You want to talk about it? No. No. Now, is that Holly's deal? That's public safety. But taking 26 different agencies and consolidating them down to six, and it's basically streamlining to have one secretary, and this is not correct, but you have one secretary who's over the entire public safety, and then you have basically subdirectors. And putting them all in one place, putting them all in one kind of communication, um, and the estimate is, I just want to say, between 26 and $30 million a year. And it's something that all the other states in the southeast have done, and we have 20, um, actually twice as many um, agencies dealing with public safety than all these other states. Uh, you want to hit on any of that? Well, one thing it does, is my understanding, you correct me if I'm wrong, I, I just got this bill yesterday and haven't really had a chance to read it, but it gives us buying power uh, to the state. You've got one agency that's doing all the purchasing and all the all the police departments and, and all the state agencies that gives them all the people to save money by you know, buying and volume. Yeah, this is a great illustration. It basically takes all these agencies and puts it under one secretary of, of law enforcement. And um, I think it's a fantastic bill. Uh, hopefully the House will take it up next week and pass that. It may be a fantastic bill. You know, like I say, I, I'm, not, I'm not slamming your bill. Don't get me wrong. No, it's not my but, bill. But. Well, whoever's bill is. I'm not slamming the bill, but I've just got some questions like you've got several different retirement systems in there, so uh, health insurance and things like that. I'm just curious if that's going to be worked out. They did, a, they did two. The governor did a study, and the Senate Pro Tem did a study for nine months, had a commission, took all the recommendations, consolidated them into this one bill. So uh, that is one of probably the most, um, I don't want to say earth shattering bills in Montgomery, but it's shaking Montgomery to the core uh, because. The governor came out three weeks ago and said, I don't want to do this. What I'd rather have to do is meet with all 26 agencies and have them tell me how they're going to reduce their agency. Well, that's how Montgomery has been done for the last ever. So this bill is, is, another, is an interesting bill. Now, get back to David's question. Um, and I think David's question was that there's another bill out there, and I think this is the same bill you're talking about, that restructures the legislature. Yes. Uh, and the operation of the legislature, which is uh, the House of Representatives, uh, the Senate, uh, all the hiring of all the people, uh, the folks that do LFR and or LFS and what are my acronyms wrong? LRS. LRS and LFO, uh, which is the physical office and the, the folks that write all the bills for us. Basically, a new bill that will restructure how all that happened, who's over that, and that's still in the Senate being debated as we speak, and there's one aspect of it that David was talking about that takes the authority out from underneath the... the um, well, they're worried about the state auditors coming out of, the, you know, the, the state auditors, auditors coming out of the merit system and falling into the legislative, you know, but being directly under the legislature, which... You know, that kind of throws up red flags everywhere, and that's... So. And actually, there's, and Dave was talking about there would be a new new um, council, six from the House, six from the uh, Senate, that would be over basically all the operations and over the public accounters, uh, account. And that's right. actually, I agree that that should be 100% separate because um, they should be independent and not have to report to legislators. I mean, the audit folks should audit what's right and wrong, black and white, and not have to report to politicians. So we, we agree with that. At least I do. Um, a couple other bills real quick. I think we got about five more minutes. Uh, you got any bills that you want to hit on? I've got three bills that I'm, I'm putting in. I'm going to just hit them real quick. I still got the Savannah Harding bill, which is a child abuse bill, and it's uh, identifying mandatory reporters. A lot of teachers don't even know they're mandatory reporters, but they're, they're responsible by law to report any suspected child abuse. And my bill last year was making everybody in the state mandatory reporter, which I found that's not going to work. But if you see child abuse and no reporting, uh, 
that, that should be a penalty, in my, my opinion. And anybody who was also protecting the people that reported it, they found it to be unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated they, it could be held against them there. And an employer cannot hold it against you if you report suspected child abuse. Is it going to define what child abuse is? No, and I'll tell you why. Uh, suspected child abuse, and I had it in my bill to have annual training for teachers and doctors and anybody that has a license or a certificate that deals with children, and it was going to identify or teach them how to, how to identify child abuse. But uh, I had to take that out because there is no standardized there is no standardized way to identify it. If, but I, just like I told everybody, I'd rather investigate 100 cases of suspected child abuse and find it to be true than fail to report one that was. And this little girl, Savannah Harding, was run to death uh, up in a towel out about nine years old, ran for hours and hours and hours and finally died. And there were four people stood there and watched that child die. And nobody did anything about it. Teachers not required now. They are. They are. Now. That's they, they are. So are nurses. The point I'm trying is I want, I want to speak with the Department of Education to see if this can be part of their orientation at the first year of the year. And this, it's, no, it's, it's no two week course. It can be uh, taught at the orientation for five minutes to say, you know, here's your responsibilities, here's what you should do. For instance, the Penn State, that coach was in Prairie, Prairie, whatever his name was. All right, he called Sandusky, and then he, he told Turner to stop. He didn't go anywhere. Now, by Alabama law, he did what was right. All he had to do was report to his supervisor that he's free and clear. He didn't have to, he wasn't required to do anything else but his turnover laws. All right, under, under my law, and I'm still working on this law, under my law, if you see it, you report it. You, you don't go to your supervisor. You go to the DHR. You go to a law enforcement agency. <coughs> And if you don't, then you should be held responsible. That's a good deal. All right, the other, the other thing I'm working on, there's a guy from Talladega called me about this. It really makes sense. Hey, that's my new district. Oh, is it? I'm sorry. <laughs> but you better, you better co-sponsor this. I'll co-sponsor. <laughs> but he, he is a visionary painter. He said, I cannot read fine print. I said, well, I don't like fine print anyway, because it's just a way of hiding stuff. Uh, and I've talked to several lawyers in, in the house, and I said, what's the purpose of fine print? They said, well, just to save space and keep you breathing. And I said, that's my point. There's one right there. <laughs> that's a lawyer, you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, there's going to be a minimum size font for any legal document that you sign. Because, it, it, but here's the downside. If, if I say legal document, what about all the things that they put in the newspapers, uh, the legal notices they put in the paper? Well, if I say size 12 font, the newspaper's going to be about that big. <laughs> so I, I've got to fine tune that one. The other thing is uh, our agenda down in the legislature from day one has been creating jobs. And I was talking to my accountant one day, and he was telling me about the business up at gas and all and he was trying to work with the state revenue department, and the revenue officer said, I'm coming to put a lock on the guy's door. He said, can't we work something out? He said, no, I'm coming to put a lock on his door and shut him down. And this guy had 19 employees. And I was thinking, if you lock this guy's door, these 19 people are going to lose their jobs. So I got, I called Julie McGee in Montgomery, the Revenue Commission. I said, how many people or how many businesses in the state of Alabama are in this position that they might get their door shut? And she got with me about a week later. She said, 150. All right, but she said, we don't lock people's doors. I said, ma'am, you got agents there out threatening to do it. Whether they do it or not, they're out threatening to do it. And I understand it might be a scare tactic. She said, we just don't, don't lock people's doors. And I got to think, 180, they had 20 employees apiece. That's over 2,000 jobs in the state of Alabama. And these people didn't do anything that's very important. So I'm, even the federal government will work with their income tax. Uh, work out some kind of payment schedule with them. Keep the doors open, keep the people employed and working. Because if you shut their door, you're not going to get that tax money. It's, it's gone. Not to mention, these people lost their jobs. So she said they don't lock the doors. Well, that weekend, my son was deploying out of Huntsville. I'm driving to Huntsville. I stopped at exit 310, pull off to the uh, restaurant with a cup of coffee, pull on the door. There's a big sign on the door that says, This business is closed because of failure to pay out of the tax. I said, Well, this is two days after she told me I didn't do it. So I've got a bill that I'm presenting to make the, the, the revenue department more user friendly. That they will work out something. It's not. It's not to forgive any taxes. It's just giving you an opportunity. In today's economy, it's tough for everybody. 
and it will give you an opportunity to pay your taxes over a period of time. But if you ever miss more than current taxes, then your agreement is null and void. A couple things I want to hit on, two questions that were asked um, before we wrap up. And um, one was, is there going to be a teacher pay raise? You know, there's been some talk about, I think the governor mentioned we have a pay raise, and the ADA's been talking about pay raise. Um, I don't think, um, you never say never, but I don't think there's enough money right now in the Education Trust Fund to be able to give teachers a pay raise. Um, we've still got to pay back what they call a rainy, rainy, day, rainy day trust fund of about $450 million. So that's going to be paid back this year. Um, so it would be questionable if teachers will get a pay raise. Uh, one of the other questions was, uh, are we going to pay back the, uh, educa no, the uh, Alabama Trust Fund? You remember on September the 18th, I believe, we uh, voted to allow to take $457 million, $147 million over the next five years. The House passed a bill last week <coughs> to pay that back. Uh, we tweaked it a little bit in the Senate uh, this past Yesterday, matter of fact, my days mixed up. Um, we, we tweaked it yesterday, and I think it's going to conference committee. That's when we change something in the House or vice versa, and then they get together and resolve it. Uh, it should go to the governor probably next week to pay that back. Uh, and the way we tweaked it a little bit was you have to pay it back over 10 years, uh, which is a lot of money. Um, but then again, if there's a windfall of money, like for example, if VP comes in with a settlement down at, uh, down at the Gulf Coast, we can use that money to pay it back. Um, well, I'm the, way, the way that bill is structured that he's talking about is, I'd like to say, it's over a period of time. It doesn't say you'll pay this much each year. And for the simple reason, if we get the BP money, then we may be able to pay more on that. Mayor, thank you for coming out. Would you like to say any questions or wrap up a little bit? Well, this one, you, you mentioned uh, something, uh, the word audit came up, and everybody in this room has been wanting to know when the city going to have the audit done. Uh, it's finally done, and I'm told we'll have it in our hands this week. I uh, want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, Dickie and I are, are doing our best in Montgomery. We work uh, real well together, uh, unlike some folks in Jefferson County. We won't go to uh, other legislators. But, um, you have my cards. Uh, Dick, do you have any cards you want to pass out? Or uh, everybody knows how to get touch. Everybody knows how to get touch. Believe my number in your book. But uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out, and uh, appreciate you guys very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>